Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to Yes Tikva's Tikva Talk. I am so excited to be speaking today with Emily Madison and Charlie Madison. Um, I'm Devorah Enten. I am a clinical consultant with Yes Tikva, and we are just thrilled to bring you this um, version of a Tikva Talk, which I think you're going to find quite unique. So I had this opportunity to meet Charlie and Emily about a year and a half ago now, and have really been anticipating and hoping to get to speak with them in more detail. There's no way we're gonna be able to cover everything that I wanna talk about and listen and hear and learn about, but we're gonna to try to cover some of the content that we um, would like to present to our audience and our community today. Um, Emily, Charlie, before I, I kind of launch into what we're about to talk about, um, Emily, just tell me who you are, where you are, Sure. So um, I think something really interesting about our situation is that we always knew that our ability to be conceived and then our actually our birth um, was a little bit of a trial and tribulation. So um, from the start, our parents told us that it, you know, it was very difficult for my mom to have kids. Um, and they took us through this story about how, you know, they were trying through IVF um, and they were, you know, really hoping for at least one child and they didn't know how things were going to go through IVF and they almost adopted um, another child as well. And I think, you know, their big thing was like, okay, and then you guys were conceived and, you know, our mom got pregnant and then we were born three months premature. Um, and so we heard all about you know, the difficulties of getting pregnant and then the difficulties of having premature babies. Um, but that's all we knew. <laughs> and I, and it's funny, I always remember a story of my dad saying like, oh, like one day, you know, one day we'll tell you, you know, really what's going on when I was 12. And I was like, what? Like, I, you know, I, that just went right over my head. Um, and then when we were, I believe it was 17, Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it was 17, our parents sat us down at dinner one night and told us that we were, you know, that we had this woman, Andrea, who we knew as our godmother um, since we were born, and that she was our, you know, egg donor, and that my, our mom was not our biological mom. And I remember sitting there, and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, I was like, all right. Um, and it didn't change anything for me. Um, and we can kind of go into all those thoughts later. Um, but, you know, the general story was that we were told kind of one thing uh, growing up, which isn't far from the truth at all. Um, you know, it's pretty much all of the truth. Uh, and then my parents decided that it was time to tell us uh, biologically and I think you know they mentioned to us for medical reasons and and for obviously the the big general reasons as well kind of you know this is where you biologically come from and but to me that just didn't change anything you know it was just another fact of life and to this day when I go to the doctor and they ask about my maternal side of the family I forget <laughs> and I have to <laughs> remind myself um you know who, who to look at <laughs> genetically. Like, can you tell me a little bit about what you remember of being a 17 year old at the dinner table? And just to clarify, you guys are twins, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Um, my experience. So um, I had a similar experience to Emily, I suppose. Um, it wasn't super jarring. Um, it, at, at first, it was definitely um, new information. Um, and I was I, working in theater and um, being a theater teen, um, it felt very, <laughs> I probably felt more dramatic about it <laughs> for my own benefit than I actually did. Um, but I do remember being a bit upset just at the fact that um, I really admire my mother. We're, we're incredibly close and we also look pretty similar. So mm -hmm. I remember being surprised at, um, between um, physicality and also our psyches that we were so, uh, the, not that we were different, but that um, that was all nurture and not necessarily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And what was your, how did your, or did your relationship change at all with your godmother, with Andrea? How did that relationship appear different to you at this time or did it? Um, 
It didn't really change at all, at least for me. I can't speak for Emily, but um, I actually forgot until this um, video that Andrea was my godmother. Um, no offense to Andrea, she's <laughs> wonderful. I just, um, uh, well, actually, um, I, I have great admiration for Andrea, but um, it didn't change um, any of my feeling towards her. If anything, it made me feel a bit closer to her children who are our genetic half sisters. So yeah. Can Emily, could you tell me a little bit more about what your relationship is like with these genetic siblings that you have? Yeah. So I was going to say, you know, we grew up with them and we thought of them as family friends and they're a little bit older than us. Um, our relationship hasn't been, you know, extremely close and we didn't see them that often, but when we did, it was really nice. Um, and you know, now that we all know this information, I think it definitely brings us uh, closer together. And we are like, we, we're all in this weird thing <laughs> together, <laughs> right. um, which, is, which is really nice, but it, it really didn't change any, any relationship at all. Can I say, I mean, what do you think it is about the way that you were raised that really kind of contributed to what I hear to be such a, such a well-adjusted, healthy, like, oh, these are my parents, like not a big deal. Um, what do you think contributed to that component of your um, post-information identification? It's an interesting question. I think for us, we knew who our egg donor was. Um, and so there weren't a lot of questions to be mm -hmm. asked in the first place. Um, and it was a very easy transition to, okay, you know, what medical information do I need to know? Um, it's hilarious because I am very short and, <laughs> you know, she's very tall and, you know, simple things like that were just kind of easy to, for us to navigate mentally or by ourselves or, you know, being open to that conversation. Um, our dad's a psychologist. <laughs> and so growing up, we were infused with a lot of um, psych psychological terms and, you know, being open about our emotions. Um, so for us, I think it was easier in that sense, because we grew up that way. But also we had, you know, we have a close family unit. Um, and so it was, you know, it just didn't make me think differently about the concept of, you know, biological versus, you know, just who raised you. It's like, these are my, these are my parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Charlie, what about you? Would you contribute anything to that part of the, you know, that perspective? Um, I would. <laughs> you could just invite the cat in, yeah. let, let yeah. her join. <laughs> I, I consider my, myself her dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what contributed... So I don't want to impose any of my thoughts about the matter and what's right or what's wrong um, and to analyze it ad nauseum, but I would be remiss not to mention that I think a pro of parents telling their children later is that there's um, already some, aside from maturity, some investment, like they've mm -hmm. already been nurtured by those parents for long enough. Um, but really, um, everything Emily said, I, I totally co-sign. Um, and I also think that um, having a connection and feeling close to my parents um, in, in actually appreciating them um, contributed to that. I think it's not just that they were my parents for 17 years prior, but that um, they were my parents and they did a good job. And I was glad to know they were my parents. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm going to add one more thing. And I think a lot of times um, in psychology, we think about the story um, and what that means. And we knew our mom's story and that it was incredibly difficult for her to try and even get pregnant and have kids. Um, and so knowing that story and knowing that she wanted us so badly that she went and asked, you know, her friend to do that for her and give her those eggs. And she wanted us so badly that, again, it doesn't make me think anything different. It's incredibly meaningful um, that she would go to that length, especially, you know, that was in early 90s <laughs> that, they were, that they were thinking about that. Um, so to me, it's the story and the impact of 
why and and how and they my parents made that story pretty evident to us from the moment that we could understand it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the age and the time in which this happened. So how old are you today? We're 27. So you, 1993. We yeah. Born. So were you one of the oldest do egg donor conceived babies. I know we've had sperm donor conceived babies for many years before that, but do you have any sense of if there were previous children that were born that are older than you? I I'm, yeah, I, I, can't right? say. I know it was definitely a novel concept yeah. Um, yeah. and different. And my mom uh, spoke to that a little bit. So I, I know it's pretty unique, um, especially mm -hmm. for, for early nineties. Yeah. Have you, either of you met other um, adults who have who uh, that, that that share a similar genetic story. No, <laughs> no. You think and looking back, um, you mentioned a little bit, Charlie, about that idea of like having talking about donor conception to an older child versus a younger child. There's no question that our trend today is about telling them almost from birth, like they know their story in the same way that you knew mom and dad had a hard time getting pregnant, that that kind of is part of that same story that we begin to tell donor conceived children um, from, from birth. I'm wondering what your perspective is, um, if that is the story that is told. What might you, con and, and I know that you might say like, what do I, I don't know, I have no idea. But like, if you were to give a message to p parents who are considering donor conception, um, and that this would be a, it, these can be very complex choices for parents to make, but they want to grow their family and this may be their option. Um, what might be some of your messaging that you think is necessary to hear, to know, to learn about um, in having that conversation with their, their eventual children? Emily, you wanna try to take a crack at that? <laughs> sure. Um, it's just interesting because I work with kids on a daily basis and, and thinking about the therapeutic side of things as well. Um, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I think being authentic and open and honest, um, as your foundation is extremely important and the message, you know, I think about myself and if I was told from, you know, from the time I could understand what that means, then I would just, I wouldn't want anyone to be it around the bush. I, you know, I'd want, uh, my parents to tell me directly um what happened and from a child's perspective obviously the understanding of how a baby is conceived um can be difficult but i i think just being as open and honest as possible is kind of the the best path um no one wants to have a wishy-washy conversation around where they come from um sure. and if you think about you know reflect on that for yourself as well um, so that, that would be my advice and that, you know, essentially the message like for us was this doesn't change anything. It doesn't change how much I love you. It doesn't change that you are my parent or doesn't change that you are my son or daughter. Um, you know, that message is consistent no matter what. And that sometimes it's just the label if it's biological. Um, so I, yeah, just the message and, and how it's portrayed. I think children, especially something as complex as a donor, um, egg donor conception, um, that it involves talking about sex um, to some extent, which is inherently in the life cycle, something that comes a little later on. Um, but then I also think that there's other developmental things. Um, too, which I was a psychology major, by the way, so it, run, <laughs> it also runs in me too. Um, <laughs> that um, things like um, self awareness in a mirror or something like if you don't have that, the telling a child, I'd be hesitant to tell a child without certain uh, developmental skills something so complex. Um, so I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I definitely think I could have found out before I was. 17, but I don't think, um, I'm not offended that I didn't know before then. <laughs> hmm. So Jessica, so you really, you take a little bit of a different approach in terms of just kind of being very, very mindful of what is going to be developmentally appropriate to tell a very young child. And how do we, how do we balance the authenticity as Emily is talking about this being straight and honest and, you know, direct and forthcoming versus can a child developmentally understand what is being told to them? 
you know, it's kind of funny you know, how you say well, it involves talking about sex. In some ways, donor conception makes it so much easier. It happened in a Petri dish. Mm -hmm. Very simple. We never even had to kiss, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's super easy. Honestly, that really brings up kind of how do we do this effectively? And I think that's one of those things that is still um, emerging in the field, I would say, in terms of saying like, you know, the science is there, but is the mental health education there to how to have these conversations? There's some nice little books that are coming out on having these conversations with our children, but the, we have to have more of these kinds of conversations with the parents to say, how do you do this? How do you do this confidently? You know, how do we, how do we make sure that we create a developmentally appropriate um, narrative at, at all ages? Very, very interesting. Well, in the last couple of minutes that we have left, is there anything else that you would like to share or talk about um, as either a message to those that will be in the future donor conceived? Because, you know, everything gets saved online anyways, um, or to the parents or the intending parents that are that are considering this. Um, Emily, any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I guess, you know, my message and thoughts would be, it, you know, it's hard, you know, you always want to tell people, don't be anxious. And we know that as professionals, that's not the right thing to say. Uh, but it's the first thing that, <laughs> that I wanted to say um, to everyone as a child who has gone through this. And I think it was interesting you mentioned, you know, we're, we're well adjusted about this, maybe not about some other things. Um, <laughs> but um, I would strongly encourage anyone to, to go through this process if they feel like they're ready and that they can have these conversations um with their future kids or with their partner um if it's too overwhelming or you don't know how to have those conversations but you're still interested in the process i would say to reach out and you know be a part of organizations like this or you know seek out guidance from other people who can really help you um or or do the research that feels right to you um but charlie and i wouldn't be here if if you know, our mom didn't didn't take that next step and do something that was new <laughs> in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So I would certainly say, you know, use your use your resources, do your research. But in the end, I think it's an in incredible process and an, an incredible gift um, to do. Right. Charlie, I'm going to come to you in one second, but I just want to comment on how critical it is that you, I love how you talked about reaching out, getting resources and connecting to organizations. Um, people should be aware that there is actual training through the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, through ASRM, specifically around infertility. There is additional training and certifications required for people who are going to do assessments for surrogacy or egg donation. Um, and, and these are things that are in place to try to create a protective measure so that people can get good, authentic guidance um, and really clinically sound and scientifically sound information. So make sure that if you're seeking support, find a therapist or an organization that really holds by that gold standard of ASRM, not just somebody who says, oh yeah, yeah I, I work with infertility. So just make sure you've got good people on staff. Um, Charlie, what about you? Last words of wisdom. Sure. Um, uh, I'll just say, um, and I'm gonna bring it full circle. I heard you say at the beginning that we identified as being donor conceived. And um, as somebody who's been to a lot of disability workshops, I've actually learned that the, the tides are changing um, surrounding that. Um, and um, I, I say that not to um, point anything out or wag any fingers as much as to um, press that nomenclature is always going to change and that um, nobody should be on, on either side or um, anybody involved with fer infertility um, scared of how to talk about it and um, out of fear of it being esoteric or, um, or too challenging. Um, there's never a right way to talk about um, really involved topics. So um, whatever works best for everyone. Yes, and I appreciate that. Um, and, and it's an interesting, you know, way of how, and I, and I think that's part of the question is, does a person kind of, um, I'm using the word identify not from, from identity, but does a person say, this is who I am? Or, oh, by the way, this is just something that like happened to me in my past, right? Uh -huh. Or like, I don't really kind of identify that way. That was just kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And which is interesting, right? Like it's not, 
both of you describe it in very, if you think about it, both of you describe it as like, I mean, it was kind of just that thing that happened, but like, it's not really part of my identity and who I am today. It's like, we've never really even talked about this more than that one time last year. Like, there's almost like, I guess we'll talk about it. But like, what's there really to talk about? Which I think is fascinating and also speaks to the, um, again, I see it as like safety and stability of the home that you raised in and, and who you both are today, it became, it's like a no big deal. I know that I'm loved. I know I'm cared for. It's not really a big part of who I am at all. Does that make sense? That makes so much sense. And um, to yes and that, um, that also I've heard in the deaf community to, um, to relate it again, um, there's um, a portion of the deaf community that um, refers to se- themselves with a capital D and it's mm-hmm. uh, like a pride in being mm-hmm. deaf. Very much. And um, I've never considered beyond, um, beyond nomenclature um, really like what, what it means to identify with something. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I feel like I'm learning something today. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, I I never would have said that about myself before. And like you said, it's just kind of like a thing that has happened, um, which is, I think has its positives and not too many negatives, but it's just a different way, different way to think about it for sure. Yeah, and I think that's actually, and it's a good tone to close on because I think to me, part of that messaging to potential parents is to say, look, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It might just be part of genetics and it's just that. And maybe as we reflect on it and kind of come to terms with what this means over 20 something years, um, maybe it isn't as big of a deal as we're feeling that it is in this moment for these future children. And I think that that's a very hopeful message um, because I think so many parents are like, well, what about my child? I know what I want, but what about my child? And what is it gonna be like for them? And I think that this message of this conversation is, is um, unique, extremely brave and very unique and um, so valuable. I'm already thinking about the people that I'm going to be sending it to, to say, you need to hear this. <laughs> you need to hear these wonderful people talk. So I wanna thank both thank of you. you for sharing, for talking, for being so vulnerable and open with me and with us as a community.